I'm speaking today on the omnipresence of God. And when I started looking at this, I just thought, Mark, what have you done? This is one of the most critical, perhaps, uh, doctrines we have, and yet it's one of the most forgotten of all our doctrines. The, the reality that God is everywhere is so critical for us to understand and to be able to live in this world, and yet it is one of the things that we are quickest to forget. An example would be for me is, as I was preparing for this, um, it hasn't been a, a, what I would say a clean preparation as I would have liked. Um, two of our kids have gone down ill. Um, Hannah had to be out, and so I'm trying to be with the children as well as trying to think on these things, and it's not an easy thing. And so sometimes you can feel that pressure build up. And as I was clearing the table to, to put some stuff down, to start looking into to this more deeply, uh, my wife is a very creative person. Um, anyone who knows creatives? Uh, tidiness is perhaps not their main <laughs> gifting. Um, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be careful what I'm saying because my, my wife is not here, but she probably will be listening in later. Yeah, it's on camera, yeah. Yeah, yes. And we have other creatives here. Um, so my wife in her creativity, she likes having these jars on the table that uh, will either be filled with rocks from different beaches that she's been to in the world or the one she has is it's filled of sand from Gernard with some stones on top. And, and in me moving these, these don't have lids on, by the way. You can see what's happening. And me moving these, the only one that falls over is not the ones with the shells in or the ones with the rocks in, you know, the easy ones to, to sort out again. It's the ones that had the one, the only one that had the sand in it. It, was, it happened to be the one that falls over and goes all over the table. And in that instance, I'm just angry almost. You know, I'm frustrated. I, I'm, I'm agitated by this and I just cry, why do we have so much stuff in this house? And in that moment, I realize the doctrine of God being everywhere is forgotten by me. Would I yell out in such frustration if I knew that actually God was there in the room with me and he saw it happening and he was there and he was probably having a bit of a chuckle like, I fell over, it's okay, you're all right. But in that moment, my frustration is the only thing that comes through, my anger, my, my wanting to have things as I want them, but not necessarily as they should be. And in that moment, I forget the doctrine of God everywhere. It happens to us often. And it's one of the reasons why we, as Christians, are so careful that we don't spread rumors or we don't speak behind people's backs. Because our understanding, our belief is that God is everywhere and every idle word we speak, everything we mutter is not just something that will fall on deaf ears. It is something that the divine himself is there listening into. All of our life is shaped by this one truth that God is everywhere. It shapes what we do when we're in the quiet place, when we're praying alone. It is far more critical for us to believe that God is everywhere then than it is in the massive big moments. God is everywhere. You see, God is working in all things. You know, the world is not this big clock that God created and wound it up and he's just let it go. And now it's just going to unwind until it stops and then that's it. It's all over and God has no more interaction with it. This is not what it means. The presence of God, the omnipresence of God, all presence, everywhere presence, means that in every moment God is working whether it's the darkest valleys, a ravine that has never seen the foot of man. 
Yet God is still there, growing up the flowers and putting the perfume within them that the bees come and collect from. God is even in the places that man has never set foot. Even in the deepest ocean where it is pitch black and nothing can be seen, God is there. In the highest mountain, before any man conquered it, before anyone got to the peak, God had already flown above it and been there himself. In the thickest jungles, in the most infested places where it is almost impossible for man to exist, God is even there in the jungle. But he's not just in the busyness and the hurriedness and the, and the life-producing jungles of the world. He's also in the silence of the deserts where nothing may, ha- may move at all and yet God is there and not just part of God. Oh no, the fullness of God even in the stillness of the desert and even in the loneliest places On the loneliest tundra, where it is frozen most of the year, yet even there where no tree can grow, God is there. God is everywhere and he is working everywhere. But he's not just everywhere. He is also Every when. See, God isn't just everywhere right now as in the sense of what we have as humans. See, we, we are so limited in what we can comprehend about what God is. But God is not just everywhere right now. He is every when right now. And it's hard for us to grasp this because we are people who are born into time. And not just time that can flow in either direction, but we are only born into, a, into the reality of time flowing in one direction. Our life is dictated by past, present, and future. And every time we are in this world, we are nothing more than one moment passing on to another moment, passing on to another moment. It is so hard to try and comprehend a God that is unaffected by moment to moment. I'm going to try and help us understand this and try and shape this a little bit. Now for you, it's probably maybe getting a little bit heady. Um, And what I'm going to speak about may be a little bit more uh, thought than you perhaps thought you would have on a Sunday morning. And if you fall asleep, it's okay. I don't mind. Because if it's nothing else than it is for me to be able to get this out, then that is good. Um, I am fine if you switch off to some of the stuff that's going to be spoken of today. But come back in the end and we'll wrap it up and it'll be good in the end. We have this picture of God and I don't know if many of you have seen the movie Bruce Almighty. Has, Has anyone seen this movie? Bruce Almighty. This movie where Bruce... Is complaining about his life. Why doesn't he get what he wants? Why doesn't he get the promotions he wants? And doubts even if God's around. And God shows up to him and, and says to him that he will give Bruce all his power. He will make Bruce like himself. And so here we have Bruce Almighty. He is, he is as if he has the power of God himself. And, I, and he goes about his day thinking, this is brilliant. He's, he's, everything he wants, he can just make happen now. And then there comes a moment in the movie where he is inundated by these voices that keep, and he can't get them out of his head, and these voices keep going. And he realizes that there's the prayers of all the people praying. And he goes, what am I supposed to do with this, God? What, am, what do you want me to do? And he goes, well, you need to pay attention to him and answer him. And so in the movie, Bruce Almighty, Bruce goes, I know what I need. I need all these prayers. I can't have them just being noises in my head. I I can't cope with that. What I need is post-it notes. That's what I need. All the prayers on post-it notes. And in an instant, all his room and all of himself is covered in nothing but post-it notes as all the prayers of the world just fill up his whole house. And he goes, well, that didn't work. That didn't work at all. 
He goes, no, what I need, what I need is all these prayers to be emailed to me. What I just need is an email list of all the prayers of the world. And instantly he sits down on his computer and all the prayers of the world come in and his inbox has filled up to over a billion prayers that are coming in. And he's like, oh, never mind, I've got the power of God. I'll reply to these. And you see him going along and he's replying to all these emails and it looks like he's going at the speed of light replying to these all. And he goes, oh, that should have made a dent. And he looks at it and the number has only increased, not decreased at all. And in the end, the only thing he can actually do to complete this task of being able to hear and answer all these prayers is he just goes, yes to all. And every prayer that comes in, it's just a yes. And then he leaves it and he goes away. This is often how we actually think of God as someone who has to have time to sit and go through all these prayers, all these things he needs to do, as if he's limited by somehow by time. But God is not constrained by time. His life is not lived out moment by moment. God is outside time. He's unaffected by time. Time is part of creation. The creator is apart from in the beginning. Time itself is part of the creation. If it is not the first thing that has been created, it is probably simultaneously the first thing that comes into existence when God says, let there be. Time is part of creation and the creator is not behind to time at all. He is not in time. He's not in his creation that he should not be able to control what goes on. He is beyond and above and beyond it. For us, time is linear, and that is the only way we can think about it. You think of every time it's explained to you, you think of every movie that talks about time travel, everything that actually tries to understand time, all it can ever say to you is this, now leads to later, this moment to the next. And then in our mind, we still think that maybe God's greater than us, maybe he's not restricted in the flow of time, maybe he's unrestricted in the flow of time. Maybe you can force fast forward a bit or rewind. Maybe you can go forward or backwards on this time stream. Maybe that's what God's like. He's just more able to be able to travel along this timeline than us humans. But this also is a limitation on God. This would assume that there is a point in time where God hasn't fast-forwarded and saw what would be, or he hasn't rewinded in someone's life to know what was. This is still a limitation in our mindset if we think that God can fast-forward or rewind time. He is not even limited by that. You see, the truth of this is that God has no history. God has no history. His life is himself. All that he is is contained within him. He is complete. He is the fullness of reality. And in fact, you can uh, describe God as the only utterly real thing. The only utterly real being is God. And let me explain that. The reason God has no history is to say that you have history is to say that you have a past, which is part of reality that is no more. Or you have a future, which is a part of reality that is not yet. History means that you are not fully real. And, and, and it is easy for us to understand this. If I say to you that when I was a boy, a swarm of bees came into a tree near our house, and we had a, a beehive that was spare. Um, we, we used to have bees, and there was a hive box that was spare. And my mum told me, go get a cardboard box. We're going to catch that swarm of bees. So with a cardboard box and a stick, this swarm of bee on a tree, we, we bring it under the, the swarm, and we smack the, the branch. And this beehive, or this swarm of bees, goes into the cardboard box, and we cover the box and we take it down to the beehive and we just dump it into the beehive and put the lid on. 
I got stung once, but we had more honey. That is not reality now. That was real when it happened, but there is part of that has been lost because the realness of that is in the past. To you, who I've just spoken that to, you may believe it, you may not believe it, but it is certainly not your reality, and it is certainly not the present now. Just like if I said that I am going to go and do such and such later and say something or be somewhere, that is not real yet. It has not happened because it is a future. Now, I may go to the coffee next door and I may have a cup of coffee, but until it happens, it is not real. It is still in the future. And God is not behoven to this. He's not held by these truths that he has no history. So he has no past that is lost or future that has yet been. He in himself is complete, and therefore he is the only being that is utterly real. This also means that he does not remember our yesterdays. He doesn't remember what we did. He just sees it. It's just now to him. There is no history for him. There's no past and present and future. It is all just what we would decide and determine as now. Just because yesterday is lost to us, it is not lost to him. It is always his now. And it's not that he foresees, you know, foresees our future or foresees our future activities. To him, they are just now. He just sees them. They aren't our reality yet, but to him, reality is all. And they are just now to him. Just because tomorrow hasn't yet come to us doesn't mean that it isn't yet for him. For him, all history, everything is just now. You are never more real than you are right now in the present. Right now. When that saying we have, just be real, what's it saying? Saying right now, don't hide, don't have any pretenses, right now, be who you are. The present moment is the only moment you are truly real. The past is no longer real because we've lost part of that. The future has not yet been. It is not reality come yet. You are never more real than you are in the present. The present is the continually existence of God. God is always existing in his now. So his reality is always complete. There is no loss and there is no not yet. In him, it is all completely now. One of the names of God we have is what? I am. The perfect present. I am. Not a past and not a future. The now. I am the perfect present. It is, it is because of this reality that God is always the now that when we pray, every individual, when we pray, it is as if every prayer that we are saying together is nothing more than to God just now. He doesn't have to divide time because every single person is now to God. He doesn't spend a little here and a little there. All of this is nothing more than now. Every single person has the fullness of God completely in the now when they pray. And we, we understand this from Scripture where he says, I am. I am. And he calls himself the everlasting Father. And he says that I am the beginning and the end. Now we often interpret beginning and end, that, that title for God saying that he has the beginning and he has the end. And yes, that's true, but there's even more depth to it in that it is more as if it's one word of beginning end. 
God is beginning end. There is no part that has passed away and there's no part that will come. He is just beginning end. God is never more real to you than he is now. All of him, the fullness of God, whatever that means, the completeness of God, whatever that means in him, the perfection of God is now. All now. Which means that you are never more completely real than you are to God because all of you to him is now. When it says that God knows you deeply, it is not saying he's seen parts of your life and he knows the parts that will be. He is saying that your reality of all of who you are, past, present, and future, is in him, is just now. You are complete before God because he sees you now. This is the truth of God everywhere. And because of this truth that God is not just a God who is everywhere, but the God who is every when, he is all consuming the, the, of all things, that in his completeness and in his nowness, he is in every event in our life. And not part of him, but the fullness of him. We must understand this, that when we come before God, whether it is in our quiet time or whether it is in a time of trouble, it is all of God, the fullness of the nowness of him. He has no limits. His dominion has no bounds. All is within his supreme rule. And every event that has ever happened is within his supreme rule. No matter how vile and evil it may be or how grand and good it may be, all fall within the realm of the supreme rule of God. God is in every event. God is in every blessing. That means every breath you take, every morsel of food you chew on, every drink that you guzzle down, every piece of clothing you put on, every heritage of your children, either from your parents or passing on to your children, every husband, wife, friend or family, God is in all. And all of this is sweetened when we see that God is in it. There is great mythology in, in, in a lot of other religions and often the great mythology of these religions would be that the pinnacle of any human existence is that they would feast with the gods. You can think of that in the, the, the Greek mythology or the Roman mythology or the Norse mythology. It all comes down to the pinnacle of humanity would be that one day they would get to feast with the gods. But for us Christians, this is our reality every time we sit down. We feast with God. The sweetness of God among us when we break bread together. The, the amazing sacrament that would be our food is in itself hand brought to us by God. The divine of all things is in those moments and we don't have to wait to a mythic, mythical future where we feast with him. Every single time we sit down, we feast with God. Every time we eat, every replenished cup, every piece of clothing we put on has been in the presence of the fullness of God. We are clothed in garments that have known the presence of God. Isn't that incredible that the very clothes that we think sometimes for me, they're a bit smelly, and yet somehow they have experienced the fullness of the now of God. God 
is in the blessings. All we have is from him. All we have is with him. All we have is to him. God is in the blessings. But he's not just in our blessings. He's in our trials. There is no darkness, no evil, no place that is so putrid of the demonic that, you, that anyone can say that there is no hope for God in that place. Those who live with God, there is no such thing as a place where God does not exist. There is no darkness for those who dwell with God. The fullness of God is now. We are not to think about the storms, although the storms may come. However menacing, however forbidding, foreboding, no matter how uh, loud and frightening they may be, no matter the storms may rage and the, and the winds may blow, we do not think upon these things. But think instead on the one who breaks the storm and causes it to turn into showers of blessing upon the land. Think not of the troubles that are over you, but think that they are under God. Don't think about that which seems to overwhelm you, because in fact under God it becomes underwhelming. Troubles and trials that seem to be out of control have not passed out of the hand of the Almighty God. He is in our trials and every trial with us. Regard not your effort of trying, but instead regard the strength of him who is supporting. This is what it means to know God everywhere. God is in our trials, and when we know that, we will look for him and not to the trial. God is in all things, and it is so good for us so good for our hearts and our mind and our soul and all of us when we acknowledge God in all the small things. Because when we acknowledge God in all the small things, our view, our view of him has this amazing, marvelous and splendid transition that the strength-inducing, God-producing, courage-enabling presence of God will increase. When we add up all those moments we think of God in, when we think of him in the small moments of our every day, when we think of him in those moments we sit down to work or when we go out for a coffee or when we are in the car or when there is storms above us or when there's trials or when there's dangers, when we think of God in all these moments, they all add up. And it comes to be that we see that even all the particles of the universe are not enough to display his awesome omnipresence, his I amness, his nowness. That not even the universe itself can contain him. God is everywhere and every when. God is in every little thing we have this saying in our in our society don't we we say the the devil the devil is in the details don't we? we we say the devil is in the details and it's almost as if god's god's above this stuff he's not in the details of stuff god has to manage the bigger stuff of of the world of existence he's not so much in the details let me tell you today that god is in the details not only that the details belong to God. He is more interested in the details than anyone else in existence. No other being is more interested in details than God. And we get this when we read Psalm 91, 
11 and 12. Let me go to that. And this is often quoted about Jesus, but it is also for us. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. He's not talking about at least you fall over a great cliff unless a calamity comes upon you. No, unless you just stub your toe. The whole almighty presence and power of God is for just a smaller thing as if you stub your toe. God is in those moments of the details that even if you have happened to stub your toe, the fullness of the now God is there for you. And not only that, we have in Proverbs where it speaks about that man plans his ways, but God establishes his footsteps, his step. We plan this thing here, and God is saying, I am so much in the detail, I'm going to make sure your foot is placed in the place it needs to go. God is in the details of our lives. And we have in Matthew where, where Jesus is speaking of the sparrows. Is there not two sparrows bought for a penny? And God knows which one falls. He's not talking about the great eagles. He's not talking about some massive big thing. He's talking about a small bird. That doesn't even God know that. And he doesn't even, goes on to speak, he says he knows the hair on your head. He's numbered each one of them. He's not talking about the days of your life. Yes, he knows that. But he's so in the details that even the hair on your head is numbered. God is in the details. And because God is in the details, he sees us as we are. And God has said to humanity that it is not enough that they just have the presence of God always, or where, all time. But that they would know the presence of God. And so we have God with us. You see, spatial distance is not the issue. Distance based upon objects uh, between each other. That is not the, not the issue that God has here. For God is in all of that. That is all completely covered in the nowness of God. See, the distance that comes between us and God is relational distance. That which is separated by sin. And God had a plan for this. He didn't just want us to know that he is a God that is everywhere. He wanted to know us to know that we, that, that we can know that he is with us. God is with us. And we come to one of the most amazing verses in all of Scripture when we come to Matthew 1.23. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is one of the most phenomenal verses in the whole of Scripture. Not only does God know that we cannot bridge the gap of separation between relationship with him, he's saying not only that, I'm coming into this world. I'm coming not just into this world, but I am going to become humanity itself. And even in this scripture it has here, we have that it's called Emmanuel, which is not a language, it's not a, in our language. It has to actually be interpreted for us. And it says, which means God with us. You see, the very start of this, the very emphasis of this is that straight away, every foreigner, every Gentile, everyone who is not part of the people of God is immediately invited in because it is translated so that we also would know. When I was in Spain, we went to an ice cream shop. And when you're going here, I'm never sure, do they speak English or not? And you're looking for that communication, that connection. And we went into a particular ice cream shop and, and the guy there... Um, his name was Rodriguez, and he starts speaking in Spanish, and I don't know what he's saying. And I said, sorry, do you speak English? And all of a sudden, he, he breaks out in this most perfect, like, uh, Midlands accent. 
that I've ever heard. And it's bizarre because most people would break out into an American accent. But here he is speaking and I'm like, are you Spanish or are you English? And of course he goes, no, I'm Spanish, but I've, I've learnt in um, England. And so he has an accent. But immediately I feel invited in that he speaks to me in the language I can understand. And immediately I feel part of being able to go into that place. And I feel invited. And this is the same as God doing this for us, which means God with us. He's translating for us so that we would know that we're invited in. And when we understand this, which means is the invitation in. But we have God with us. And if we emphasize the God with us, it becomes even more incredible. This God that we've spoken of, the God who is the only real God, is the only real being because he is complete in himself. He has no history. The omnipresence of God is now with us. He didn't send an angel, which would be scary because, of course, it has not the power nor the might to complete all things. He has not sent a man, which would be utterly desperate and despairing. But he comes himself. But not only that, he comes not as the perfect, omnipresent wholeness of God. He comes in the form of man, made from dust, fallen man, rebellious man. This disgusting, gross, sin-ridden, corrupted decaying, dying humanity and the God of all things, the God of all reality comes and places himself into that. God with us. And this union that God has, this divine power, this marvellous, incomprehensible purity comes and dwells within human form. Charles Spurgeon calls this the divine stoop of love. How far did God have to stoop to come to us? In Romans 8, verse 3. For God, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. He did this for us. This sin-ridden humanity, this corrupt and dying humanity is now being fused with the immortal God. God has chosen to wed himself to humanity. He has chosen to unite himself and make union with humanity. It is such an incomprehensible truth. Charles Spurgeon says this, I am persuaded that no man has any idea how wonderful a stoop it was for God thus to dwell in human flesh and to be God with us. I'm going to get to the end soon. Just bear with me a little longer. God with us. He is joining himself to humanity. The God that is now the full reality of God has now been joined with humanity. It is not a part of God. It's not as if it's some moment in God's existence. No, somehow in the marvelous mystery of it all, it becomes part of the fullness of who God has always been. It is not a historical moment for God. It is just now. It has become part of his I amness, part of his nowness and this is our greatest joy and hope 
Because if he has chosen to wed himself and unite himself and join himself to humanity, it means that he cannot destroy it. He must be there to save it. Because it is now part of who he is in his completeness. The incarnation must mean peace with man. It must be that pleasant and profitable glory for mankind. And the crazy thing is, is that every single human made is somehow created to be filled with the divine presence of God. This body, this corruptible being, this flesh, somehow in the creation of how God puts it all together, it is somehow able to full, be full of the nowness of God. The fullness of God somehow wedded and united to humanity. And it's not just God coming to be with us and to take on humanity so that we may become pure humans. No, it is something even greater than that. Now we have been caught up into the fullness of who he is, that that there is an elevation to something even greater than that now. It is not that we will go back to what we were when we were created. Now that we are merged into the union of the divine, we have now been elevated to something even greater. It is not like a drop of water into the ocean. It is not that we get consumed, that we get completely absorbed into the greater. No, you see, when we come into the fullness of the God that is now, we become complete as all our reality is now within him, we become more real than we've ever been and ever will be. God with us. He has done the impossible. That which was corrupted and destined for death, is now incorruptible. It is a mystery of the incarnation into the life of God in Christ. Spurgeon puts it like this, whatever is possible or whatever is impossible, Christians can do it at God's command, for God is with us. Do you not see that the word God with us puts impossibility out of existence. (laughs) Do you not see that the word God with us puts impossibility out of existence? God with us, the incarnation has made all things possible. We are called to live a life not of the impossible, but in the possible. God is everywhere. God is every when. God is in the details. God is with us. John Wesley, when he was on his deathbed, or close to dying, he often had these words on his lips. The best of all is this. God with us. The best of all is this. God with us. So as we go from here, as we take each step, as we gather um, together for coffee later, as you sit down for your meals, as you tie your shoelaces, Let it always be in our thoughts and our hearts. May we be motivated by this one truth. The best of all is God with us. Let me finish with a part of a prayer of St. Patrick. Christ be with me. Christ be with me within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort and restore me, Christ beneath me, 
Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. The best of all is God with us. Let me pray. To you we come, the great I am. To you we acknowledge the God of nowness. May all of our days and all of our thoughts and all of our life be emboldened, be uplifted, be ennobled, be empowered, be strengthened in this truth that God is with us in everywhere we go and every when we are. We ask that we will not forget this truth, that it would not be something that we are so readily able to pass off into another good talk, another good thought, but it would be embranded on our hearts that the best of all is God is with us. And we pray that this truth will deeply root in us. That as we sing songs to you, as we read your scripture, as we encourage one another, as we take courage from you, that we would do it all with you. In the knowledge that God is with us and God is everywhere. There is not a place that you have not stepped that we go So, Lord, be our shield, be our guide, and brand into our hearts the truth of your nowness. In Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. I've gone a little bit over, guys, but be blessed. Those who need to go collect your kids, do so for the rest of us. Let's fellowship together with our tea and coffee next door. Be blessed. So great to see you today.